there's this aspect of this which I think is um, interesting, which is the kind of the way that these these influencers they they are apolitical in the sense they don't provide material analysis of the problems that are no. ailing. You know, why do people have suicidal ideation? Why are people depressed? Why are, why is suicide going up in this way or that way? Why? Uh, you know, all of these social issues, these are social problems that manifest on the individual level, but it certainly are social issues. And so there's individuated responses, individuated ways that we can um, heal ourselves or, you know, elevate ourselves above the, the sin, I don't want to say sin, but kind of the darkness of, of the world, you know, this yeah. sort of idea. Right. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, pre- it's presented as like almost a apolitical uh, movement or a political perspective, but it certainly is not a political. And I think that that's what's, um, I, I would like to get your thoughts on that aspect of something presented as a political, but actually being deeply political as a project. Well, I, I would say that it's unconsciously political and there is a history behind that. Mm. Um, I mean, I think if if we're thinking about why so many wellness influencers that wind up promoting conspiracy theories and QAnon or Pastel Q are always, you know, advocating for individualistic solutions to the terrors that they invoke, um, that is effective because. Uh, they are speaking into a culture that has been actually depoliticized over decades. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a great book by uh, Sam Binkley, um, uh, who's a professor of is it history or sociology, um, and I think he's at oh geez I forget somewhere in New York <laughs> anyway. It's his okay. book is his book is called. I'm, I've got an interview with him coming up. His oh, okay. book is called his book is called Getting Loose, mm. and it's a like a Foucauldian study of the construction of the self in the 1970s. And basically, what he says is that um, at the twilight of the 60s, when there's a dawning and shared realization that the progressive goals of the anti-war movement or you know the ultimate goals of the civil rights movement or um let's say the 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 radical equality goals of the black panthers are not likely to be achieved mm-hmm. that there is a broad-based internal turn that begins to sort of strike this bargain and to say uh, okay um, if we cannot change the world, um, perhaps we can change ourselves. Mm. Perhaps we can uh, embody the kind of looseness of spiritual transformation in our careers, in our, you know, polymorphous relationships, in our, you know, uh, you know, our, our our athletic activities as they move more in towards you know, yoga and stretching and whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and the 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 getting loose is really falls in this sort of interim period between the um, you know the the Fordist economy that precedes the 1960s, where you know, along with Don Draper, you're gonna have to work your job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the social, tensions of the 1960s uh closing in on people with this demand of we have to change the world and we have to change it now um and getting loose is a response to all of that and and it was a really important book for me to see because to read because um it made me understand that part of the getting loose project as it had shown up in the yoga yoga and wellness cultures that i inherited in the 1990s was that you were not allowed to talk about politics and political organization um that the basic theme of wellness and yoga was going to be rhyming with the demands of neoliberalism which is which were to be responsible for yourself to be responsible for your own health to follow your own bliss 
to be, you know, responsible for your own self-actualization and to and to have to do that because you're not going to be able to rely on anybody else. Mm-hmm. And you know, in in our book actually we have this this tracking of um articles in yoga journal that which is kind of like the trade you know magazine for the yoga industry for and it has been for about four decades Mm -hmm. uh and what we wanted to see was like you know at what point did this magazine touch on politics uh and and we basically found six or seven articles that that started to peter out you know, by the mid eighties or so. And they were expressly about how the yoga practitioner or the person with wellness mindset should move towards an apolitical above the battleground stance because, you know, the, the tensions of being either on the right or the left or somehow passe, or, you know, they're just reflections of your own internal strife and that sort of thing. Um, And so, you know, if you have a uh, a, a, a yoga and wellness and alternative health culture that is structured according to those rules of uh, the self project. You know, you're only really going to be responsible internally. You're going to wind up with a whole generation of people that has no real political education, uh, no real political drive. Um, and then if you take those same people and you professionalize them into the the gig work world of the 1990s, uh, especially if they're working in in wellness or in organic food or whatever, uh, they're also going to be working too hard to do political activism. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I just think that like it, when when I mean there's there's this thing where where in in 2019 there was a year long effort in New York City. Uh, that was trying to unionize yoga teachers uh, so that there could be some sort of living wage standards so that people could apply for ban- for, for benefits if they were full-time, uh, so that conditions could improve, people could get, could get paid for travel time and stuff like that. Uh, and they got really far along the way uh, down the road talking to I don't know the the Teamsters or or one of the organizing forces in in New York City, um, and they were about to vote, I think, and then the pandemic hit, uh, and I think everything fell apart. Um, as I as far as I know, the studios closed, nobody was meeting. Um, I th- I think there was an initial ballot that indicated interest in 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 unionizing, but. It, what's what's notable about this is that it was the single effort in the global north within any wellness practice or demographic that I was aware of, of anybody starting to think of themselves with any kind of material consequence, right? Mm. And and it it, you know, it could have gone through, it could have been thriving today if there if it wasn't for the pandemic. But what happens was what happens is is that um, you know, the yoga and wellness worlds become vectors for right-wing neo-fascist conspiracy theorizing not only because they might uh the the individual members might be attracted to body fascism for example or to the the fantasies of purity and pollution that's in there too but it's it's also that they actually don't have any political resistance or resilience to spare when it comes to a powerful movement rolling through their demographic, right? Mm -hmm. It's like for the first time in a long while, the yoga and wellness community was sort of told, oh, you can get yourself involved in politics by, you know, uh, amplifying your ideals of bodily sovereignty and and you know your 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 fantastic capacity to boost your immune system, which will mean that you don't have to let the state vaccinate your body, which is sacred mm-hmm. and all that. So mm-hmm. so it, it's it's like because the thing about the thing about depoliticization is that it creates a lot of boredom too, right? Like mm-hmm. um, people don't have, uh, I, I think people don't have sort of uh, over time 
a clear grasp on what they want to do in their lives and their communities. There's only so many green smoothies that you can drink before you go, okay, now what? Right. Right. And so I think that, I think that the, the, um, the pandemic opened this doorway for a depoliticized demographic to be swept up into this very exhilarating, um, you know, premise that they could participate in, you know, defeating uh, the deep state, and yeah. and it was very effective. Yeah. This uh, you you mentioned this, but um, this concept of body fascism, and uh, I wanted you to describe that, but I, I just want to reference something here because it reminds me of two things, which is, um, I had an interview some months back with a journalist named Arun Gupta who talked about uh, mass yeah. shootings in the United States. And uh, how fascism, he described it as a corporeal ideology. It's an ideology very much fixated on body, on the yeah. body, on bodies. Um, you know, he's referencing Trump. Trump's always talking about people's bodies, talking about how disgusting they are, how this or that. He's using really, you know, descriptive terms. And um, even when he's not talking about bodies, there's often an element of body in it, like some kind of descriptor of something being horrific or just, you know, you know what I mean? He's just, there's this language he's using. He's obsessed, right? He's, he's obsessed. completely obsessed. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and rightly so, because mm -hmm. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, I think he probably exists on the daily in a sense of bodily terror, right? Yeah. Um, there are, there are many, many things that he has to deal with, I think internally. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, there might be chronic pain, uh, I think that, um, you know, from from various reports that the effects of long term drug use have been very difficult. Uh, I mean, this is a guy who has to put himself together to perform Donald Trump every single day. Uh, and that's kind of that almost takes on a sort of metaphysical necessity, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, uh, I don't know what it's like to be a Donald Trump per se, but there's, <laughs> there's, I, I can't even uh, put myself in that headspace. Um, <laughs> but, but this sort of thing that is a, a fixation within health and wellness cultures of the kind of ever perfect, you can uh, continuously perfect your body, you know, through rigorous discipline. Um, you see this in. Uh, you know, weightlifting uh, subcultures. You see this in uh, again these yoga cultures as well. So I, I see this this emphasis on the body, and within this sort of so called apolitical space, it's again it's quite political. And I think there's something about fascism as a coherent and cohesive political movement that seems to be emerging on some level, um, or sort of proto fascism in the United States and elsewhere. Um, kind of capitalizing on or taking advantage of what we think of as an apolitical movement as being actually quite political. You know, there is something about fascism that takes advantage of the apolitical. Yeah, absolutely. And it takes advantage of basic bodily anxieties and um, inferiority complexes. Mm -hmm. You know, when when I think of body fascism in its sort of originary modern form, I think of uh, listeners can can Google uh, Eugene Sandow, um, but it's a strange spelling. It's it's E U G E N, and then Sandow is S A N D O W. And if you just bring up the Google images, um, you'll see an incredible uh, dude. Um, <laughs> he's Prussian. Uh, he has this barrel six pack. Uh, mm. chest. He's not developed in the way that, uh, you know, a Schwarzenegger or a modern bodybuilder would be uh, developed. I don't think that he had all of the the sort of bells and whistles for that, and certainly not the resistance uh, exercise equipment. Um, but this was uh, pretty much the original modern strongman bodybuilder who was extremely fond of posing like uh, a classical Greek hero, uh, complete with fig leaf and sandals. And um, he, what's interesting about him is that he was very vocal about why physical culture was essential in his view mm -hmm. to the health of humanity, but specifically to the health of the nation state. He was very much driven by the concern 
that was raised by American eugenicists. And actually, he renamed himself Eugene after the term eugenics, which is kind mm -hmm. of on the nose. But yeah. he was um, very taken by uh, the mathematics of American eugenicists who were looking at immigration figures and wondering what was going to happen to all of the white people. Does this sound familiar? Um, and uh, his premise was that uh, if white people in the global north do not develop themselves physically, uh, if they continue in their urban office lifestyles, if they continue to lose contact with the earth and you know the soil uh and if their blood does no is no longer connected to the soil which might sound familiar to some listeners as well uh they will be out reproduced by the more vital um citizens of the global south who also happen to be brown and so he was like really um obsessed as most physical culturists were with a kind of racial suicide that he felt was being caused by modernization, which not only was about you know urban lifestyle, but it was also about the weakening effects of you know Jewish interventions like modern medicine. Mm -hmm. So there was this fascination with the organic. There was a fascination with the natural. There was a fascination with uh, the sort of you know self-contained and sovereign power of the body, and it didn't stop however at the body because the 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 body in the sandow legacy which leads into the physical culture of the teens the 20s and the 1930s um becomes a kind of you know individualistic expression of sculpting internal purity so that it can be embodied in the nation. And so the whole point, all of the language of the physical culturists uh, makes this microcosm and macrocosm comparison between the human body and the health of the nation. And so, you know, impurities, whether they be from modern medicines or from chemicals in in uh, agriculture or from, you know, um, whatever might sort of biologically attack the body, that becomes a metaphor for what might culturally attack the nation. Uh, and that might be, you know, people with brown skin, it might be people who uh, aren't Christian or or don't, you know, mm -hmm. mesh with with the 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 you know the 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 culture of of the the colonizer nation. Mm -hmm. So um the the way what's what's fascinating about it is that um that whole jam becomes extremely influential in the modernization of India. And uh, as physical culture develops amongst proto-nationalists within India in the 1930s, um, Eugene Sandow and all of his heirs are intensely popular. In fact, Eugene Sandow did a tour of India in about 1904 and, mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of thousands came of people came out to see him pose and do tricks on vertical poles and lift weights and stuff like that. Uh, and then, you know, after that, there was like 20 years of people buying his weightlifting manuals and having them shipped to Bombay and Calcutta and so on. And uh, of course, to be used by, you know, people who were fairly well educated and they were reading English and they were going to go on to sort of lead the nationalization effort. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as that happens, uh, Indian yoga emerges, uh, not in the Iron Age or medieval sense of, you know, mystics who are doing very careful and gentle physical practices in order to enhance their meditation, but yoga emerges as a kind of spiritual and nationalistic calisthenics mm -hmm. um, that is that is about, you know, body weight exercises and posture and standing up straight. And um, and what's fascinating is that is that as that becomes uh, more popular worldwide, through the 1950s and the 1960s, everything that I think people commonly understand about yoga 
uh, in terms of just what it feels like, uh, an attention to a straightness of posture or to an elevation of posture, mm -hmm. the capacity to, you know, uh, be both flexible and strong, but to always arrive back at some kind of like balanced, um, you know, anatomical position. All of those concerns with sort of physical grace and alignment and symmetry um, are kind of the, they're the, they're the, I don't know, they're the guideposts for how people begin to conceive of wellness and balance and health within the global north. Mm -hmm. And and you know, I think that I think that um it it made for some really strange cultural classes, clashes. Um I always like to um tell the story about how uh in 1969. At Woodstock, the whole music festival is opened by a guy named uh, Swami Sachidananda, who later, by the way, goes on to be accused of sexual assault by his students. But that's another mm -hmm. podcast. Mm -hmm. He he opens the festival by chanting Om really loudly and doing a prayer, uh, singing Ram, the name of Ram, and he's surrounded by acolytes in in either white or saffron robes i can't remember which because i've only seen black and white photos i think and um they're sitting incredibly upright and straight and he's chanting to this field full of half naked hippies with bad posture and you know and grubby hair and you know they're they're pretty pungent and they're smoking dope or they're having a wonderful and bacchanalic time and they think that swami sachidananda is somehow liberal they think that he's <laughs> they think that he's progressive right they think that his prayer invoking universal peace and harmony is somehow uh, reflective of their own, you know, aspirations towards e equality and and you know world unity and you know anti racism and so on, and it's just not. He's he's coming from an environment of, um, you know, nationalistic fervor in which yoga is kind of like a soft politics of piety and cultural um i would say like uh discipline mm -hmm. uh, that has that has that really doesn't have anything to do with you know in india for example undoing caste oppression uh you know the rights of women um you know figuring out how to uh you know extend public health services to the poorest people in the in the in the nation instead of offering them yoga classes and ayurveda mm -hmm. yeah so i mean it's it, what's fascinating is that progressives from the 60s onwards really associate the yoga that they inherit with india with their own progressive values without understanding that as they're being told to stand up straight and to exercise and to you know execute these postures perfectly that they're actually being trained in a discipline that emerges out of this nationalistic physical culture and you know it's not like i would say that has causal you know mm -hmm. effects or anything like that that it secretly turns people into qanon supporters decades later but it does make people familiar i believe in this intergenerational way with the sense that spirituality means something extremely disciplined about your body uh and that notions of purity and pollution are really important uh and that the state and public health institutions really don't have any role to play in that because that's going to be between you and god or you and your guru mm -hmm.